right, well, it looks like we have a good group of people. So let's go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. My name is Laura McLeod. I am the head of Jedi Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at Axon. And I'm so happy to be here with all of you today to talk about building an inclusive workplace culture. Um, I have with me amazing panelists. So Lauren Bailey, Carmen Jandasek, and Joe Walsh, who will be introducing themselves in just a moment. A few housekeeping notes. As you can see in the Slack, please, or in the chat, please do add any questions that you have while we're hearing from our panelists in the chat. We'll get to them as we can, and we really want to hear from you and the questions that you have. Thank so you. my personal background is that I said I'm the director of JEDI at um, Axon. I really care deeply about DEI work, particularly because of my experience as a biracial Black woman in tech. Um, completely changed my career path because of that. I've been working in this industry for quite some time since, and I'm super excited to talk with all of these folks today about what makes them passionate about this space as well. So the goal of today's panel, a couple things. We want to talk about how to create a diverse, equitable, and inclusive workplace, how that manifests in HR policies and procedures, why DEI work is so important, and also the positive impacts DEI has on workplace culture and employee performance. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to our panelists to introduce themselves. Let's start with Lauren. Good morning, everyone. It's so great to be here. And this is a really important topic for us. So I'm excited to share what Upward Projects is doing. And um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of it. And you probably know us um, more closely as the parent company to Postino, Windsor Churn, Federal Pizza, um, and Joyride Taco House. So we have about 1,400 employees in three states, soon to be four. We just signed a lease in Atlanta and um, we're growing. And this is a huge focus for us as we continue to scale and um, add positions across the country. Really excited to be here with you guys. Thanks, Lauren. How about you, Carmen? Good morning, everybody. Uh, Carmen Jandasek. I am the Director of Ethics and Total Rewards for Arizona Public Service. I'm also the Chair and the President of our LGBTQ Alliance, and we launched that in 2014. Um, also, just like Lauren, a very um, passionate subject area for me, um, working in an organization that is 130 plus years old and bringing them forward to reflect um, the culture of today. That's fantastic, Carmen. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, Joe. Thanks, Laura. Uh, very, very proud and privileged to be here. Uh, Joe Walsh, I'm the Vice President of People and Culture here at the Arizona Diamondbacks in Chase Field. Um, you know, uh, there's, there's no better time to pull this panel together. I've, I've been in the audience for Point of Pride for the last three or four years. Um, fairly new to Arizona in my fourth year, uh, but not new to sports and entertainment in, in year, year 30. I'm afraid to admit that, but let's call it 29 for now. Um, and, and really, in terms of, of DE&I uh, and, and belonging, these topics are awesome for me, for us, our JEDI Council. I'm really cool to see that the JEDI acronym, because we just named our, uh, our DBAX for Change Council, JEDI, about three months ago, uh, J.E.D.I, uh, trying to stay away from any, any Star Wars litigation there. But uh, we all know what it stands for, and Laura, Laura just made the shout out, so kudos, Laura. Um, and I, I'm just happy to be here and talk about and, and learn, and learn from you all and, and here in the panel and the audience, because the learning never stops. Um, Angela and I sat down about two and a half years ago. And uh, I repeat this every time I'm with her and see her, but uh, our work is never done and the learning never stops. So I'll add that to the phrase. And so welcome everybody. And it's gonna be a great, a great hour. Thank you. I love that our work is never done. And with that, let's get with the first question. So as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion, what are some of the advantages and some of the challenges that you've all found in your careers to attracting and retaining people specifically in the Arizona market? Carmen, I see you're unmuted. Absolutely happy to, to jump in here. And I think that, you know, in the Arizona market, we we have to we have to work um, past, I'd, I'd say, the stigmatization of our state, of our state not being a welcoming and inclusive place to do business. We need to ensure that companies want to relocate here, that companies want to relocate their employees here. And I think 
coming out of the pandemic now, we're in this really vulnerable space where people can go work anywhere for anyone at any place, right? It's often been shared, this is the year of the great resignation. If you aren't meeting my values as an individual, I'm going to go work someplace that are meet that, you know, that does meet those values. So, you know, we as each of our organizations and, and through this state need to work really hard on what our value proposition is. Companies are doing a great job with it. We need to collectively do it um, so that Arizona is a great place to move your family and a great place to thrive. I love that. That's the first time I've heard the year of the great resignation. I love that. Any, anyone else want to chime in here? I would add to that. I think that's absolutely the case. I also think it's kind of time to take a stand. And I think a lot of companies for a long time have just been like, oh, we'll sit on the sidelines. We won't, we won't not do it, but we won't, we won't put a pin in the ground and, and a stake in the sand and say, this is what we stand for. And this is what we will or will not tolerate. And to me, this was really a year of, um, of taking those risks and courageous behavior so that not only your customers know um, what you stand for, but um, just as importantly, your employees do too. And they know um, what the values of the company are. And I think for a long time, it was sort of valued to live in this ambiguous state um, of, of not taking a stand or having a position. And, and for us, um, being crystal clear about that has allowed us to not only attract employees, but also lose some that we needed to lose and some customers that we needed to lose too. Yeah, definitely. And the courageous behavior of taking a stand, right? Definitely. Joe, it looks like you were going to add something as well. Yeah, two great points. And I'll, I'll tag on to Lauren. I, I, I think that point about losing some employees or customers that you need to lose, uh, we, we got to look that straight in the eye. Um, and not in a mean-spirited way, but look, sometimes when, when you articulate um, your values, what you stand for, your, your employee brand, employer brand, your proposition, that may not resonate for people. And, and what you don't want is, are those people that it doesn't resonate to, to hang out and bring other folks down. And it's okay. It's, it's okay to move, move that on, or maybe it's a customer or whatever it might be. Um, these don't always have to be hard conversations. There may be a better place for them. And I want to also add, you know, we read and hear about the growth happening in our state here in Arizona, uh, more manufacturing, more this, more that, the other thing. I wrote down, you know, with, with that growth of industry and, and, and companies, um, we believe that's also going to bring um, more diverse candidates to the pool, um, whether they're coming for one thing and they leave for another reason or they're, they're family members or whatnot. And Angela just, you know, I wrote this down, you know, I think Mesa, Scottsdale, Glendale, Tolleson, all that's going on um, legislatively uh, for, for more people to feel included and, and invited into these municipalities in our state. All that together is, is really positive for us here. And, and as we look at it, look at our talent pool and candidate pools, uh, we're, we're inspired by all that. And we don't have a lot of jobs all the time here, but at the same point in time, we're always recruiting, always looking for, for great people to be a DBAC. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really important to point out all that's happening in the legislation arenas to be able to attract that talent, right? As well as understanding, going back to what you're saying and Joe jo was adding on to this idea of it's no longer acceptable to not have a stance, right? What is your corporate social responsibility? And saying nothing is saying something. And so you will lose some people and you also will hold, hold to your values, which is really great. So speaking of policies, legislation, and kind of moving past that, what are some ways that your organizations are going beyond? Or what are some ways that organizations can go beyond written policies in order to, cr to create that inclusive culture that we know employees need? I could, I could start, start this one off. I love the question, Laura. Um, I, I think and feel and believe policies are uber important. We, we still have to make sure they're inclusive, they're communicable, they're accessible, they're not buried somewhere. But at the same time, I think organizations need to be, need to be open and vulnerable that, um, that we're all not there yet. There is more work to do. And for us, uh, over this past 14 months, it's education. You know, you think about, let, let's go with age diversity, you know, the age spread of, of employees in your organizations, uh, four, maybe five generations. And, and with education, you've got to meet people where you're at. And I'll stick with ages because people my parents' age in their 80s, um, you know, they, they may see things differently than, than a millennial or, or a Gen X or a Gen Z. And so 
being patient with with people during their learning journey where they're at, uh, you may see some judgment. Uh, I ask people to suspend judgment. I ask people to appreciate differences. And if you can get them on those two questions, um, which I say every day four or five times, I think you're going to get a, an employee that wants to learn or has that willingness to learn. And here at the DBACs, we had a very robust six session social justice all employee once a month training opportunity last year. Uh, we're, we're headed up to the finish of five sessions with one community. Uh, Angela and Janine and company have been awesome there. And we're heading into uh, people with disabilities training, two, two big seminars coming up toward the end of this year. So relentless training and education. And then before, during, and after the educational sessions, you know, the one-on-ones that happen, meeting people where they're at, and see how they react to it. Um, a lot of people don't show up, but the ones that do, uh, we feel they're ready to learn and, and be vulnerable to where they're at. And a lot of them come out and say, hey, Joe, I never knew about this. I never knew the language or this or that, or people felt that way. So I have a lot to say on this question. Thanks for asking it and uh, willing to hear what everyone else has to say. Yeah, absolutely. I love the idea of education and meeting people where they are and being able to be open and vulnerable, right? In that and role model that behavior. What else, Carmen? I see you're unmuted as well. Yeah, you know, we are leaning in hard in the education space and, and, and really trying to um, move one heart, move one mind at a time through really powerful storytelling. I think that um, we don't do enough in the workplace around storytelling, and I think that that um, is really moving the needle. I think we're also trying to look at things from a multi-dimensional perspective. So as an example, when I stood up the LGBTQ Alliance in 2014, and we have other um, 10 other employee network groups inclusive of that, and each network group worked hard to create a feeling belonging for their kind of Aryan dimension that they were representing. But we know that for us to move the needle in the DEI and B space, we need to intersect them and we need to bring them together and we need to be cross pollinating on ideas and on opportunities. Another opportunity, I think, is that as as leaders of companies, we have to do a better job of explaining of what good looks like in the space of inclusion, right? We talk about inclusion, it's it's still a relatively new topic, but we talk about it, but we don't always give a lot of definition of what, from an employee perspective, how can I be good in that space? What does that look like? What are the things that I can do to be better? Um, and so we're also working around, you know, really giving tool sets to employees to help them um, be better in the inclusion space. Yeah, absolutely. Lauren, do you want to add on to that? Of all of that, it's great. I um, I also think that the important piece of policy is, is two parts for us is, is one that it's acted on because it's one thing to put it on paper. And then when things do, we do put those intentions that we behave in that way regularly that those policies state that our behaviors um, daily reflect those intentions. And I think having recurring points of interest where they, they become part of daily action is really important because a lot of stuff that we put on paper at times can get shelved and sort of forgotten. The second piece that the reason that we really try to galvanize this is creating the why this is important because we've found in our business that people will have a much higher probability of acting in certain ways or trying to get people to do things differently if they understand why. And we create a lot of, um, in all of our documentation and, and policies and procedures, we create the reasons why these things are in place and why they work. And so we talk about a lot of diversity really breeds a sense of innovation and creative problem solving. We bring different ideas and experience to the table we can solve problems faster, more creatively, better. And when our team really understands that and they, they, they have a higher tendency to embrace that because they know, you know, the restaurant business is full of problems on the daily. I mean, we, with time as it's 10, 16, we've had like, I don't know, 30 happen already today. And so we're getting we're really good at problems and, and our team knows we're even better at problems, solving problems when we have a diverse set of brands thinking about them. And so we're trying to really attach the why to the policy piece. I love attaching the why. That's often so much of what companies miss, right? That why and having employees find their why as well. Um, I want to go back to something that Lauren and Carmen, you both touched on from the standpoint of what good inclusive behavior looks like, right? And kind of defining that or helping employees to see that. So we talked a little bit about, um, you know, seeking out diverse perspectives, having diverse perspectives in the room. What else does good look like for employees embracing inclusion and equal treatment on a daily basis? 
to me, it's courage. It's like having the moment where you say, I literally had this phone call from one of my best friends this morning. She works at a salon and overheard this woman saying like a, a racial slur against Chinese people. And she's like, you know, I had this moment where I'm like, just should I let it go? And I think part of this is, is training people. When you see something, you say something in all these different moments. And, and so much of it is, is courageous behavior around uh, not even just calling things out, but having ideas and, and courageous behavior for yourself of questioning, you know, why is it that I think the way I think and how was I raised and how was I socialized to believe these certain things or questioning your own um, sort of behavior systems and how, how your own biases that you may not even know about um, exist. And I think having that deep sense of courage to do all of those things around this is, is probably the most important starting point for me in my mind. Right, so that awareness piece and back to that education piece. Carmen, you're, how about you? Absolutely right. And I think, you know, Lauren hit on this so well is that we, we have to um, give people the tools to interrogate those type of microaggressions. And, and sometimes it's just flat out offensive statements that people are saying, right? And, you know, creating an environment that you can hold two truths. One, what they just said was inappropriate, stereotypical, and two, not judging because how else do you help bring somebody along without then employing that courage to say, what you just said to me is not okay. Let me help you fail safely and be better going forward into the future, right? Um, and so often I think that we just haven't, we haven't armed, we haven't provided the tools to people to feel that. And when, when an employee can be wrapped in the support of an organization that Inclusion is table stakes. So we expect you to speak up and challenge in this space. Um, that is that is going to drive results in creating the kind of culture that you want. Yeah, absolutely. Someone put in the chat and emotional intelligence creating inclusion. Absolutely. So thinking about what I heard from you, empathy, um, not what I typically call weaponizing wokeness, and then as well psychological safety. Right. So being able to provide people that safe space to get curious and make mistakes. Joe, anything else you'd add on to that? Yeah, I, I think the group really nailed it. Um, you know, for, for all this to work, in my observation, um, that suspension of judgment, that psychological safety, that's got to be in play. And they're, they're more than words. I think that personal connection um, needs to be there. And so when, when you call out someone for saying something and you're courageous in doing so, that quick follow-up of, but hey, we're here to help. We, we still believe in you. And, and if you want to do the work, we can help you get there. Uh, Derek Hall, our team president and CEO, says we're family all the time. And we all know on this call, everyone, families are messy. Families are dysfunctional. And so uh, we don't take that term lightly here because it also connotes uh, the trust and the spirit we have to help each other along the way, e even on the bad or the worst days. And my goodness, we, we've seen some bad days through the pandemic and furloughs and, and layoffs and, and whatnot. Um, and so doing all this together as a family, um, appreciating our differences, suspending judgments, here I go again, um, all, all that needs to be modeled um, on a daily minute by minute basis, we believe. Absolutely. So go back to that, you know, vulnerability and role modeling, the fact that we are messy, right? We can be open and vulnerable and make mistakes in order to encourage other people to do the same. I love that. All right, so switching gears a little bit, talking about last year. So the Supreme Court ruled in the Bostock case that employment discrimination was against LGBTQ plus people was illegal. And so even though that was, that's now the law of the land, we knew that businesses had already been implementing inclusive policies so that employees were protected in a wide variety of categories, including sexual orientation and gender identity. And so thinking about policies, legislation, I know Joe, you mentioned earlier, that's a great way to attract that talent, right? To the Arizona market. Um, why do you think in inclusive policies work? Um, why is it so necessary to have those two pieces, right? Both internal company policies and legislation. And then what have you seen as the benefits of inclusion in your workplace? Kind of two-pronged. Yeah. Yeah, so two-pronged question. I, I, I truly believe it works because um, we want and need people to bring their whole selves to, to, to work and uh, not leave part of yourself on the shelf at home because the company or the environment uh, doesn't allow it or doesn't have a policy that allows it. So we've made those policy changes. And you know, for us to be creative, innovative, and attractive, 
to to em, em, employees, that that has to be a non-starter. That that has to be on go. And, and so, when we feel that we have um, our whole selves, regardless of what they are, here coming to the DBACs, we we do see the courage. We do see people speaking up in meetings. We do see people modeling see something, say something, which is a, you know, a great phrase and a great reminder. And, you know, without that, um, we, we think we might see people that, that are afraid to speak up in a meeting or afraid to come to work or end up looking for a job because they don't feel like they're, they're free to do so. And so it, it, it all sounds kind of macro, but it does fall into the micro very quickly. And, you know, those of us that have been in the people business most of our careers, um, it's pretty easy to see, you know, in a meeting or in the hallway or wherever it might be. The challenge was how do you see it in the virtual world, which which made it really, really difficult on, on Zoom calls and when we were in the office for about 14 months. And so I noticed right away that coming back in, and we've been back here at Chase Field since uh, I think it was May or March 22nd, we all came back optionally. And then we we um, we all started coming back more. And so we're we're pretty much here every day now. Um, you know, most of us vaccinated, those aren't follow, are following a protocol. Um, you know, that that face to face contact is really, really important. And we do believe thoroughly and intensely that you've got to have these policies and behaviors that that are inclusive and have been around here for quite some time. And I give credit to people like Nona Lee, our chief legal officer, who's been on a lot of these calls and seminars back to Derek Hall, and even all the way up to our ownership, who uh, gives the way permission and space for this inclusivity. Because without that top leadership, uh, it's really, really challenging to drive. And I think people get frustrated. And, and in addition to uh, some of you else, we, we have uh, eight BRGs. We call them TPRGs because we use the word team player instead of employees uh, that fall under the leadership of our, of our JEDI Council. And so um, the movement is strong here. We feel like we're, we're just getting started, but at the same time, it's, it's very strong and it's, you know, it's guided by policy, guided by committees and everything else. So we, uh, we're very proud and we've got a lot of work to do, as I'll say again and again. Absolutely. Yeah. So what I heard from that is just really focusing on the fact that this benefits our employees from a standpoint of engagement, being able to retain them so they don't go elsewhere and even opening up blind spots, right? So having those great ideas come to the table because employees feel safe sharing them, definitely. Parman, I see you're unmuted as well. Yeah, you know, I, I see the power of inclusivity at the decision table every single day, right? And I think we're working hard to move from the talk to the walk, right? So it it is, um, absolutely a commitment, but now how do we play that out in the day-to-day, -day, every single day, and especially in the decisions that we're making? And, and to give like a real-time example of this is, as the Director of Total Rewards, I am interrogating every single benefit program that I offer from a DEI and B perspective, right? I, you know, I cannot take for granted until I do that work, until I really interrogate everything that I offer, every process that I have to make sure that there isn't anything systemic that is in any of those programs and or in any of those policies and procedures that I have. And I think that's the walk that organizations need to do is they need to dig deep into their policies and procedures and say, okay, when we created this, what was the bias that was potentially uh, at play here and how can we reinvent this for the future? I love that. Thank you for modeling that intentionality and that the work that it takes, right? To interrogate and move from the talk to the walk, which a lot of companies are still trying to figure out for sure. Lauren, anything else you'd add on this? No, I think it's so great. It's just so neat to hear that. And you know, for us, we really value um, innovation. And so when you asked about what benefits do we see for this? I think that that's just so huge and can't even be understated. And I think when people make a, co a connection to, to, again, like I said, the why about what we do with things and consistently reminding like, wow, that's so great. Like we solved this problem so fast because so-and-so had this idea and so-and-so had that. And we really just catapulted and the level of innovation when it comes to marketing and um, R&D ideas and how we design spaces and how we creatively solve problems. I mean, it's it's exponentially and and I, in the question too, even the size, like about how do you help people learn? I think the positivity around this 
or the way you said like um weaponizing the woke i think the opposite of that is like highlighting the benefits and it's it's just easy to forget to talk about that stuff to really like we're all about changing behaviors specifically with our team or getting things like go a certain way and I think rather than, and you guys have touched on this, but rather than making people feel good, how do you make or feel bad? How do you make them feel good around what they're doing and that these things really push things forward and they make situations better? It's not like, oh, I'm going to guilt people or make them super nervous to say anything or do anything. It's about, I think, really inciting people that there's so much good that comes from this and highlighting those great things that come from it as much as you highlight the things that create challenges around it too. Right. So kind of what you were talking about earlier of the why, the company why, and then what's every individual's why for pushing this forward, right? What is the benefit for them? And even like small examples of talking about, you know, the person asked, how do you get people privileged to help with this mission of teaching others? And I think one, they need to step up and say something like I said earlier, but two, it's like having these really little small micro examples that happen day to day and understanding um, where we're at now and where we want to go, and then how these this, these diverse sets of, of, of teams really contribute to, to moving the ball down the field faster or better or more fun or more creatively. And, and those pieces and parts are like really great to talk about. And I think that that really helps change behavior in a positive way. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. So we did get our first question. We're going to go a little off script for a little bit and answer discuss this question that came up. Again, if you have any questions around anything we've talked about or anything in the inclusive workplace space, please do feel free to put it in the chat and we'll try to get to it. First question is sometimes for people of color, queer folks and other marginalized groups, it can be really difficult to confront microaggressions and general blind spots, ignorance, and often it, the burden falls on others, right? Others from underserved identities to do that teaching. Um, to others to be inclusive and mindful. So how to marginalize people and form others without making themselves responsible to teach everyone, right? Taking on that burden solely. And then how can people with privilege step up in some ways as allies to support their colleagues to encourage a more inclusive environment? So again, two-pronged question. Carmen? I can, I can jump in here. So I, I think by proactive education and you know creating the tool set to help those that are allies you know those that are in a position of privilege to really help interrogate that that is going to be really important and i think understanding that you know dei and b is not is fairness and equity it's not special treatment right so creating some really powerful powerful consistent narratives in your organization that you can lean into those that are struggling with it um, and help open a conversation to maybe open up their frame of thought reference um, and understanding to be better. Absolutely. Yeah, I love the fact that you point out fairness and equity, not special treatment. We're going to come back to that around <laughs> creating some clarity around equity. But anyone else want to speak to that question around how to not put that burden only on marginalized identities for teaching and how to have support colleagues and standing up and creating more inclusion? I would just say like, you know, I think I talk to a lot of people and I'm in um, a few business groups like YPO and EO that are pretty much mostly the members are um, white males. And I find that the majority of these folks like really want to be active in this area and just don't know how to do it. Um, or what to say. And there's a fear that like, if I say anything, it's going to be the wrong thing. And so I'll just say nothing and hope like, I'll keep my head down. I won't get, I won't get into it. And, you know, I, I think a big part of this is, is people that do have awareness of this and like all the people who are on this panel and all of us who, and, you know, I'll, I'll give Angela a huge credit right now, because I remember when I met her, I think it was four or five years ago, and we had coffee at the Henry and we started talking about this exact topic. And I felt like her approach was so great because she wasn't over here trying to demonize anybody or, you know, make Republicans feel bad about that or whatever it was. She was really focused on how to get people the tools in which to be more inclusive and not about demonizing people, but giving them ways in which they could say things and tools in which, hey, when you hear something like this is a great way to talk about it. And I think that that people who do have these positions where they can teach Joe like you, I mean, you have huge reach in, in a world that is full of what I would generally say are privileged people, but 
to give them tips and tools on what to say when they hear or see something. I think that's really the challenge is I find a lot of folks are really like frozen and they tell me often like, you know, I hear this, I say something, but I don't want to say the wrong thing. So I say nothing. And to me, I focused on those guys and gals that like, Hey, here's what you can say, or here's what you can do. And like I said, my friend called me this morning and she's like, I just overheard this at my salon. Like, what do I do? And the great thing is, is that people want to do this. I think they just need leaders like us to step up and help them with the specific tools, specific languaging and ways in which to move the needle on this. Because the great thing is, is there's this huge desire to do so. It's just kind of the next subsequent steps that follow that people need guidance on. Yeah, safe space to ask the questions that people think are dumb or to make those mistakes. I know that one of the things I often say similarly, Lauren, is um, people who are from marginalized or underserved backgrounds, they, these are still uncomfortable topics, right? No one's ever comfortable calling out these behaviors or educating or talking about this. It's just that some have more experience having worked that muscle because it's their livelihood, right? It's what they live and breathe every day. So normalizing that this is this can be tough tough and tricky for everyone joe anything else you want to add just add to that i think like listen if i'm going to be really straight about this because i feel really passionate about it if you're going to be a leader in 2021 you damn straight better figure out how to help with this and talk about it or you shouldn't be a leader because it is not a question of if you want to do this anymore it's a question of you you have to do this it's a key piece of leadership now it's not like it was 20 30 years ago or even when i started in the restaurant business it's not like this is an option. It's it's a requirement of leadership. And if you're going to choose to go into require into leadership, you better understand and learn your own skills and your own way to move the needle on this. And if you don't want to do it, get out of my way because I've got 20 other people behind me that'll stand up and do the right thing and help other people move this needle. I love that. Damn straight. Yeah, that was amazing. Thank you, Lauren. Joe, anything else you want to add to this particular question from our? I, I, I think those responses were spot on. Uh, I get chills listening to them because they're so inspiring to me. Um, and I'll, I'll be straight right now. Um, as the 50-year-old uh, white male looking looking all all these, these wonderful faces, um, I've put action plans in for myself and encourage other allies here. And, and look, our pie chart is very white male, which is not unusual in sports. It's frustrating as hell, but that's what we got. That's what the pie chart looks like. So bringing allies along every day, uh, getting vulnerable with the allies. How, how many uh, underrepresented friends do you have? Are you going to dinner with? Are you talking? Are you texting with? Um, every single day, you know, my goal is to try to bring another one with privilege around this place uh, on, on the train or on the wagon with me. Um, and it, you know, you do see success and, and the conversations are tough. They're difficult. They take time. But guess what? They they fall. You got to put them on the top of your to do list and not bury them, because if you do, that's an easy way to avoid. And I think many of us, uh, a large portion of us, whatever us is, are programmed to avoid because they're difficult conversations. They're tough. Um, I teach a leadership academy here at the DBACs, and regardless of it's on the syllabus or not, and it is most of the time, we we move to Brene Brown and her work on shame research and vulnerability. Um, proud to say this year, uh, out of my a whole class of 15, the preponderance, the majority are women uh, for the first time in four years. And so we're, we are moving the needle and I'm challenging the men in the class to get vulnerable, to understand where they are with all this stuff. And again, to my earlier point, meeting them where, we're, where they're at. And, and a, lot of where, a lot of where they're at now is a tough spot because it's filled with avoidance. It's filled with I don't know what to say, so I'm not going to say anything. So everything that was just mentioned is uh, is are the hottest topics we have going right now. But we're in it, and we're proud to be in it. Yeah. Well, I think just to add to that, sorry, Laura, I just want to add this one thing. There are so many men that I know that want to be enlisted in this cause, that want to move the ball forward, that want to do what they can do, and I think they get a bad rap, and it's really. And the answer is not to like seclude the white men in the world. Like that's not the answer. It's to inclusivity means everybody, not just these people. And I, I do know there's certainly a segment of people who are resistant to this and want to preserve their privilege, but there's a big chunk of people who are not, and they want to see things change. And I think to me, it's like Angela is the, the person that I look to and am inspired by the most to enlist all these folks in that. And I know there's tons of them. Like Derek is a huge example of that. Joey has been like before this was even a thing. And, and, and it's important to know that those, there's a, there are those men that are about this and it's awesome. And I know many, many of them. And so does Angela. I know you're being quiet on there, Angela, but I know you do. 
That's fantastic, Lauren. So many people are telling or putting in the chat that you're giving them chills and they're really resonating with what you're saying. So thank you. Um, another question from one of our from one of our viewers today. In the legislation in the legislative session yesterday, the topic of Arizona companies that had a policy of not weighing in on social or political issues came up. How can we as the public encourage Arizona companies to understand or help them understand that it's not acceptable to no longer have a stance um, like we've been discussing in this panel so far? What are some ways that the public and people who are participating in this panel as attendees can do to kind of move that needle? I, one of the proudest moments that I had at my company is when we signed the unity pledge, right? When we gathered dozens of individuals um, for an amazing photo to show that kind of public commitment. Um, so definitely Angela has led that charge for many, many years, um, without a doubt, in, in creating that opportunity for companies to publicly show that kind of support. Love that. And that's what Angela also put in the chat. Anything else we want to touch on there? Lauren, Joe? I, I think I think signing the pledge, yes, which which we've done. I think, you know, bring in one community to help talk to your people and, and train your people and and have access to, to groups like that. And uh, there are other groups as well too. Um, look, as a consumer, um, you know, maybe you're not going to partake with a company that doesn't include, you know, and be be pretty overt about it. I'm not going there. I'm not shopping there. I'm not buying their products. I'm not going to not going to give them my money, um, whatever that might be, and, and, you know, tell others about it. And here's why I'm doing it. I'm not just being a jerk. I really, I really don't believe uh, this company is inclusive, so I'm not going to be a consumer of that company. Vote with a wallet. I just saw the, the, the comment from Janine. That's what I'm saying in better words. Thank you, Janine. Yeah, absolutely. Lauren, anything else you want to add? Super. We, um, when George was murdered, we, um, took a big hand and, you know, we're in the restaurant business and we painted on Windsor. Everyone is welcome. Like many years ago, I think 10 years ago or something. And part of that does mean people are welcome who don't think like you think. However, um, you know, we elected to close the restaurants the day that his body was transported back to his family. And so that our team could have a day to reflect. And a lot of people were like pretty upset about that. And we got a lot of letters from people and I touched on this earlier and I think it's one of these points where you need to be a little comfortable with the uncomfortable and knowing that I got personal Facebook messages I have a biracial child too that were like if you're going to let ins in your restaurant and this is going to go on I was like we're not coming and I remember being like shocked for a moment that this is really a thing like happening in this moment but then really I opened my opened my eyes so this is what some people deal with every day and wrote back to this person like, great, I'm really glad that you feel that way. And we've identified that you're not welcome in the restaurants anymore. I'd love it if you wouldn't come in and thank you, like have a great life. But my company and our team and like what that meant to our people and our community um, was huge. And I think it was a risk, but it was the right one that we took. And like I said, I know we lost some customers, but they were ones that we don't want anyways. And it, but the ones that we lost, it galvanized for us, our community even further. And I'm really, um, glad that we did that. And even though a lot of people called me and a couple of our investors were like, Hey, are you sure about this? It could be polarizing and da da da. And I was like, we're doing it. And we never looked back. And I'm really glad that my team was supportive of that decision. And so was, um, everybody else, um, didn't change it. That's fantastic. So I want to, before we move on to the last question that I have, I want to go back to something we were, we were talking about, Lauren, I know you said that, you know, more often than not, there's a large group of particularly men, white men that want to get involved. There are some that um, want to protect that privilege. And then um, Carmen, you had mentioned this isn't giving handouts, right, or special treatment. It's about fairness and equity. So for our audience, I would love to just hear from all of you what equity means, right? Because oftentimes we get stuck in talking about equity and DEI without really understanding what that means and how that relates to equality, not being, you know, special treatment or handouts, things of that nature. So Carmen, starting with you, I'd love to understand and create clarity for our audience there. Absolutely. Equity is about access. 
Uh, it is about um, ensuring that there are no biases or barriers to um, whatever it is that you do, whatever it is that you offer at that point in time. Um, it, it's, um, and it's, it's intentional, right? It's intentional work in the equity space that is dismantling anything that would not provide access to others. Absolutely. Lauren, I see you're unmuted as well. I just agree with that. Um, I think that it's it's a really special time to be a leader. And I think like being a part of this is is so awesome. And um, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm always an optimistic glass half full person. And I just think it's such an honor to be able to be a part of this change. And you know, when we're old, little grandma sitting on our um, porches talking about the way things were like our parents do. And I mean, when you think back to the things that have happened, it hasn't really been that long of a period of time when things were much different and I'm excited to be a part of it. And I know my team feels the same way. And we're just, um, we're just really pumped to be someone that wants to a, a company and people that want to put a, a stake in the sand early on and, um, help other people be inspired to do the same. Awesome. Joe on equity. Yeah. Great, great responses there. Um, look, the work is every day and back to my earlier thought it's, it's not buried on your to-do list you show up with it um you do the work every day equity not not my analogy or not my story but let, let's don't give away shoes to everyone let's give away shoes that fit to everyone the right size and what that means to me and to us is that um individual consideration is, is the shoe size right we can pat our backs on giving away a free pair of shoes to everyone and all in size 10, but guess what? Everyone's got a different shoe size and uh, you got to learn what the shoe size is for it to fit, to say you uh, you have equity, you, you stand for equity. And, and then going back to policies and going back to pay and title and everything, that stuff's got to be scoured and looked at all the time, job descriptions, you name it. And you don't get to just finish it and put a bow on it. You, you got to start over again and, do the work again. And it, it really, it really is relentless. That's the word I have for it. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is that giving every person what they need to be equally successful and have equal opportunity, which is fantastic. So the last question that I have, and please do continue to post your questions in the chat if we have time for them, is related to the fact that Juneteenth became a federal holiday last week. So that was a pretty historic moment and an important recognition for a really important time in our US history. Um, but it's not the end of our collective journey um, as a society, as a country, by any means. And we know that there's real work that still needs to be done um, outside of making that a holiday. So increasingly individuals, businesses, organizations are all using their voices to try to challenge the status quo and our systems of racism and acknowledge our systemic racism issues um, and to try to take meaningful action. And so how has your organization been a part of that, been actionable, been holding yourselves accountable for challenging the status quo? And then how have you personally evolved or learned over this past you know, year or over this past kind of movement that is arising. Lauren, I see you're unmuted. So we did um, Juneteenth, it happened really quickly. And so there wasn't a ton of time to plan. Um, just I'll give you a little like back of house logistics speaking. Um, and so we elected to our, our corporate office took the day off on Monday, which isn't really a thing to do, but um, that was something that we wanted to engage in right away to give people a day to think about this and um, and also play part in the, the organizations and stuff that they do. But we also donated um, a significant amount of some proceeds from that day um, to several organizations that promote um, different ideology around the support of Juneteenth and what it means and, and helping people educate. So we a lot of people we found, I read this article that I think it was like 60% of people didn't even know what Juneteenth is or what, what's meaningful about it. So we took to our platforms to try to educate people. Um, and then we're looking forward to next year and having this, this um, be something that we help raise money for every year for the restaurants because we do have so much forward facing um, like Joe does too and APS as well, but so much forward facing um, public awareness opportunity that we can really leverage. And I think that's again, something else that as these types of companies that we represent, um, we have a responsibility to do that. And I think we'll come up with some even more, even more better ideas next year too. 
Right, definitely. So I love that responsibility piece and the investment piece, right? So Juneteenth is not only a day of education or celebrating that day, but investing in businesses and organizations that are working to, you know, take action against systemic racism. That's fantastic. Thank you. Carmen, I had seen that you had unmuted as well. Yes. Um, so, you know, as as a company that serves a, you know, provides a, a vital um, kind of backbone service for um, the state of Arizona, one thing that we as an organization want to ensure is that our employees, they represent our customers, right? They represent um, whom we are serving. So not only are we taking the time to do a lot of customer listening, but doing a lot of employee listening also um, and finding out what is important to them, especially in the space of holidays, right? And holidays and recognizing holidays. I think with um, the, uh, the, the new holiday of Juneteenth, it really opened up a much larger conversation of do the holidays that we have represent what's important to individuals, right? And so we are even looking further beyond that to make sure that we are representing um, what, what is important from a, from a multicultural perspective? What are the days that are really important that we need to be celebrating um, as an organization? So we're taking a very intentful and very purposeful look um, at, at that to ensure that we have got kind of cross-cutting support across the organization to make sure that it's reflective uh, of what's important in all of our different communities. I love that, really making sure that you're being intentional about reflecting what's important to your employees. Yeah. Fantastic. Joe, anything you'd add? Yeah, um, great responses. I'm proud to add what we did here at the DBAC. So on, on the 16th, which was uh, Wednesday, I believe, we had an all-employee meeting, all-team player meeting, a private screening of the film, The Other Boys of Summer, which is an awesome compilation of the story of, uh, of Negro League Baseball as told by, by players with the movie producer uh, before and after for Q&A. Um, last year, uh, in 2020, we, we made Juneteenth an official company holiday. Um, so we had it off last year, a day of reflection. And then as well as this year, we, we uh, recognized it on the 17th, which was Friday. Um, and then on, on Juneteenth, or sorry, the 18th, which was Friday, on Juneteenth, which was Saturday this year, we had a whole uh, baseball game, a home game, uh, you know, centered around, around Juneteenth with, with pregame, um, inning breaks, um, lift up your voice and sing was was performed in the outfield, which was awesome. Talk about chills. That was really really cool. And then recognition throughout the game, and and it felt like it felt like a start, right? It felt it felt small to me. I was in the crowd with my family, uh, but at the same time, just as we had Pride Night a couple weeks ago, which was um, probably our biggest and best, we do see June, the Juneteenth celebration on the baseball field with our fans and our players uh, evolving into a much, a much bigger thing. And we're really, really excited about next year already. Yeah, I love that. And speaking of everything we've been talking about of, you know, start a small start is still a start and the work's never done, right? So it will continue to evolve. Thank you all for that. That was really fantastic. Um, any final thoughts? I know we have about 10 minutes left. Um, people need to go on to their next activities. Any th final thoughts that our panelists have after kind of being in this discussion around inclusive workplace culture, all the things that we've been discussing, how employees and the folks on this call can continue to get involved, or any final words of wisdom for our attendees? I'll, so we I'll have start. To, um, oh, go ahead, Joe. Oh, sorry, Lauren, didn't mean to cut you off. My, oh, you mine, is really, mine is really quick. I'm gonna challenge all of us uh, on the call, on the panel, and the call, Let's set a goal to bring someone new every day, one person a day um, at work, at the shopping mall, in your family, and, and, and just and track it, whether you keep a journal or however you keep notes in your phone. Let's commit. And maybe it's two people a day, but maybe you start with one person a day. I, I've been doing that for, for about a year um, and, and, you know, sometimes fail, sometimes succeed. But um, it, it's a, it's a to-do item that's ingrained in, in my person, in my brain. And, um, I, I just want to see a commitment for more. Yeah, I love that, like commit to one action, right? And really stick to that and try to hone in on that. Lauren? I was know. just gonna say, I wanna give a ton of credit to um, some of our younger staff members because they really had courageous behavior and raised their hands when they started seeing things happen and were really 
thoughtful about presenting ideas to our team um, that really helped us make great decisions and do things that impacted our communities in a big way. And, um, you know, a lot of our young people um, are at the forefront of this, you know, just because of their proximity to social media and, and things just happening a lot faster for them. And I'm 41, but I, I do feel that the spread you know, I remember going to high school without a cell phone and um, even college and like getting an email address at ASU and being like, what the hell am I going to do with this? Like, what is this thing? You know, so I'm familiar with like both sides of this world. And um, you young people that are on the um, on the line, I think a big piece of this is you view the world in such a beautiful way. You, you don't come with as much baggage as some of us who have been around a little longer. I'm counting on you guys to raise your hand and have ideas and help us be better and question the status quo and really lean into the innovation side of the way you all view the world. I think that you guys are some of the most spectacular generations that um, that I've seen in my time. And um, I'm really excited to see how you influence and inspire all of us leaders to, to be better, to stand up and, and have a higher level of consciousness when it comes to our sphere of influence within um, our own leadership and our companies um, and all the people that we represent and have access to and that you guys lean into that and force us to leverage it and think differently. I love that. And I love the call out to younger generations to push, push forward, right? And drive that innovation. Carmen? Well, I, I want to remind everybody that, first of all, uh, of course, to, to be good in this space, you have to be vulnerable, right? Um, that's like, it's a key number one. It's a key number two is always put your oxygen mask on first. This work can be hard work, right? This is something that you have to be tenacious with um, and it can be draining at times and you have to take good care of yourself. Um, additionally, coming out of COVID, we've just found a year where we had significant destigmatization in the mental health space, right? So making sure you take good care of yourself so you can care and take this charge forward is really super important um, as you continue with it because it, it can be emotional. It can be emotional. It can be how, how are we not um, moving faster? How are we not making better progress in this space? And, and I also think that, especially in the case um, of an organization as old as an example of APS, we take for granted that our leadership just gets it and knows it. And we, we can't, we need to really employ a lot of reverse mentoring. We need to help them along. We need to give them that education also. Um, and that's where I think it's so important when you have that kind of top down approach where you've done that education um, at the very highest levels of the organization where you've created a playbook for your organization and you're gonna push that culture down is so very important. And uh, you know, I work with an amazing senior leadership team that gets that, that is at the table, that is willing and ready to learn every single day. And that's how we are gonna move things forward. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for calling out self-care and knowing when you have it and giving yourself grace, right? Especially for those people who are constantly pushing the needle on this work or working in the space or of underserved backgrounds that can be really tiring. And uh, one of our attendees said, you can't pour from an empty cup, which is, so true. Um, thank you all for your words today and your words of wisdom and your perspectives. We heard a lot about, you know, both development, education, but also this idea that no one's an expert in this space. Like social justice isn't something you learn overnight. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is never something we're done learning about. And so we're all just at different points of our DEI development journey, right? And so that's a really great way to bring people along to understand that no one understands it per perfectly. We're all learning. So thanks so much. We have about five minutes for everyone to get back to their activities. Thanks for joining and we hope to see you soon. Have a great rest of your day.